good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let's uh, uh, stand up today and, and, and praise God by uh, being thankful. We gather together to ask the Lord blessing. We'll sing two songs, uh, and then uh, we'll sing another song after the announcement. together and uh, we can be thankful to God that he gives us that privilege we can gather as believers in Christ hear his word spoken and then also we are able to apply it to our lives as the Holy Spirit leads us so with that in mind I'd just like to welcome you and wish you God's blessing as you worship today 
I'd like to also welcome uh, Matt Buechler. He's in our middle here, in, the mid in our midst here. He's standing right there in the back. And uh, wishing him a uh, blessing also as he preaches God's word to us. So to begin with, we'll read some of the announcements. Uh, I'll read one that's not in the bulletin before we get started, uh, so I don't forget it. Uh, where it says, uh, it's time. It's that time of the year again when we all have the opportunity to pack shoe boxes for ready children or needy children around the world. Frank and I, that's Frank and Rhonda Dick, uh, would like to encourage each person to grab a box, fill it with love and toys. The boxes need to be back here at the church by November 14th, and from here we will then transport them to the drop-off location. So keep that in mind. Pick up a box if you'd like to be and are interested in it, and then have them back here by that date. And we'll have it in the bulletin again, and it'll be on the uh, board uh, next Sunday as well, just to, uh, as a reminder. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, bring up um, a lot of you are familiar with the uh, YFC uh, Portage fundraiser uh, later today. I also wanted to bring up, it's not in the bulletin yet, will be uh, soon, um, the YFC McGregor uh, fundraiser. It'll be uh, November 12th. It'll be a pickup meal at the Austin Hall. Um, and so the date of that one is November 12th. Uh, there's no cost to the meal, but uh, donations are encouraged, and we, it's asked that you pre-register for a meal by November 1st. Uh, you can contact myself, and uh, again, it'll be in the bulletin next week with my phone number, contact information, or just uh, get a hold of me. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. The uh, Thanksgiving dinner attended to play which was being planned for today has been cancelled. Maybe in the future, sometime, we, we might be able to get together again and, and do that, uh, maybe catch up somewhere. Uh, the Saturday, October 23rd at 11 a.m., there will be a memorial service here at the church for Susan Jones. The family has asked that the attendance be limited to those who are vaccinated or have had COVID or have had a recent negative PCR test. And they say thank you. The next one is next, uh, next Sunday, October 24th. There will be a Sunday school. There will be Sunday school for all ages, starting from 10 a.m. to 10.45. Uh, worship service will begin at 11 a.m. And we'll, we are still looking for some Sunday school teachers for the grades 4 to 5, 6 to 8, and also for high school boys. There will be a membership meeting on, uh, at 7 p.m. Tuesday, October 26, to discuss constitutional changes and receive a report from the Pastoral Search Committee. Also, our annual membership meeting is coming up. Uh, it will be November 16th and 18th. And there's a few things for you to read there. That's the, uh, the fundraiser that Jason just mentioned is right down the bottom there as well. So we'll leave that for you or you're reading there. The, the Gospel Union Mission event has been moved to an online presentation and can be viewed starting Saturday, October 23rd. That is it for the announcements. I'm going to ask Diedrich to come again and lead us in some more singing, please. I guess this, this particular song, Great Is Thy Faithfulness, is, is one of my favorite songs because about how faithful God actually is in, in all our circumstances. Some of your eyes are saying.
This time we're going to have a scripture reading, and uh, so I'm going to ask you to turn with me to John chapter 16, and uh, I'm not sure what Daryl wanted me to read, but I think we missed it somewhere, and so I just picked this uh, uh, scripture passage, we're going to read John chapter 16, and it speaks about the Holy Spirit, it speaks about God, and it speaks about Jesus. 16, beginning at first uh, verse there. All this I have told you so that you will not go astray. They will put you out, in, out of the synagogue. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you. I did not tell you this at first, because I was with you. Now I am going to, to him who sent me, yet none of you ask me, where are you going? Because I have said these things to you, and be, because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth, it is for your, for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment, in regards to sin because men do not believe in me, in regard to righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear, but when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, he will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to, glory to me by taking from me what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. In a little while, you will see me no more, and then after a little while, you will see me. It's a nice pulpit. 
I like, uh, I like working with wood myself, and I'm a big fan of how this looks, but unfortunately, it doesn't give me much to hide behind, and I'm a bit of a pulpit grabber when I preach, so I'm sorry if it's smudged up for the next person. Uh, it's just how I am. Uh, good morning. It is very good to be here with you all this morning. As was said, my name is Pastor Matt Beitler. Uh, I am the associate pastor at West End Community Church in McGregor, Manitoba. And it really is a blessing and a privilege to be here with you today. Um, this is my first time joining you here for worship. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this. I'm seeing some familiar faces out here. Uh, a lot of very unfamiliar faces, but that's okay. Uh, there's a, a number of men in here that I've been blessed to serve with on the YFC board for our area, uh, either currently or previously. Ryder, just because I'm preaching at you today doesn't mean I'm not gonna make you do push-ups on Tuesday at practice. Um, I coach him in volleyball. So I, I, I don't see a ton of familiar faces though because I haven't lived in this area for an overly long amount of time. and. I'm, I'm debating with myself if I'm still allowed to say that, if I'm still allowed to say I'm new to the area. I'm in my fifth year at West End in McGregor. I'll let you be the judges as, you know, the true Manitobans. I'm just the import. Um, but I am very thankful that I've, I've gotten the chance now to come and share with you. Uh, and I hope that it goes well, that I don't get run out of the building afterwards and I get to come back and do it again. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is I hope the Lord speaks to me and he can remove me from the equation here that we might benefit from his word. Uh, as I said, I haven't been out here overly long, but I just want to share with you uh, my thoughts on Manitoba as a new guy. Uh, my initial thoughts and opinions on this place, forgive me and let me finish, please. Uh, they weren't great. Um, <laughs> My wife actually grew up in McGregor, and, and so I, when I would come out and visit her when we were dating, uh, my experiences consisted of four things that kind of stood out to me. One was the humidity. I grew up in Southern Alberta, so a Southern Alberta boy like me didn't handle that very well when I would step out of the house and it felt like I got slapped in the face with a wet towel. Um, with that humidity and the wet that just kind of is in Manitoba, with the exception of this year, it was an unfortunate year, uh, came literal clouds of mosquitoes that I would see just roll across her parents' yard. And that wasn't doing it for me very much either. And then wood ticks. We don't have wood ticks where I grew up. So having to check my socks every time I came back into the house is just was an annoyance for me at the time. Um, so in my mind, not so appealing. But the fourth thing that stood out to me was the, the people were great. So I hope that's enough to not get me in trouble uh, with saying those things this morning. The people were great, clearly enough uh, so for me to marry one. Uh, but when God called my wife and I uh, to ministry here, we, after we got married, we were living in British Columbia. Uh, when we were called with the opportunity to come and minister in McGregor, um, those first three factors weren't a factor in the decision-making process. Um, the people and a desire to serve the Lord were. And so there was no other response in our minds uh, other than, yes, we will come and serve out here. And it has been uh, a wonderful experience for us so far. I truly have fallen in love with the province. I can look past those other things now. I really enjoy it here. I like to fish. There's not a lot of that in Alberta because it's a bit of a barren wasteland. Um, but I've, I've grown to love this place, and, and so out of that love comes just a great joy that I have to be able to share with you here today. Uh, I'm very thankful, thankful like the Apostle Paul, um, nice segue right into the sermon, thankful like the Apostle Paul at his opportunities he had to reconnect with churches that he had either planted or been able to influence during his missionary journeys. So we're going to be looking at one of those interactions this morning in 1 Thessalonians, so if you would join me there. Looking at chapter 4, that would be great. Um, we're going to look at the first 12 verses specifically, and I'm going to pray uh, for this morning's service before we get any further into it. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I thank you so much uh, for this morning, for just a beautiful day outside and, and a wonderful opportunity to be here together with brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, regardless of whether it's our our first interaction together, or, or we've had many, God, it is a joy to share this experience. It is a joy to share in your truth. It is a joy to share in this time of fellowship 
worship and praise. And so I pray that that would be what continues in this message, that your name would be glorified, your truth would be amplified, and that we would be able to grow together through it. Lord, I pray that you would remove me from this equation, that you would set me to the side, that we would see you in what we look at together today. Lord, please bless us. Uh, please encourage us and please guide us along through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I have a quick question for you all before I go any further. You can raise your hands if you'd like. Who here has kids? Quite a few hands up. Okay. For the rest of you, who here has been a kid? <laughs> all right. I was hoping that that would encompass all of us, but you never know. Every now and then you meet that 10-year-old kid who you think he's like always been 40. Like he's just more concerned about the farm and the economy and politics than he is about being 10. I've known a few of those. If that's just me, I'll, I'll leave it alone. Uh, but so with all of us having had kids or having at least been a kid, um, I'm sure you've heard this statement I'm going to bring forward at least once in your life, probably more than once. Uh, go check on and then fill in the blank. Go check on your brother. Go check on dad. Go check on... Have you heard this before? Is this just me? Was this just my childhood? Or... Okay. I'm seeing some nods at least. Um, my childhood experience was filled with a lot of that. Uh, all sorts of different things, whether somebody was taking too long to do chores, longer than was expected, go check on him, see what he's doing out there. Or whether it was, um, you know, so-and-so has gone to the bathroom and they haven't been back for an hour, please go make sure they didn't fall in. Or, this is specifically for those of you who are parents, when you have that like eerie, uncommon silence that is just unnerving in your home, please go check on them, something must be going wrong. Right? This is a statement that I'm sure we've heard before in some way or another. Well, this is more or less what's happening in the book of 1 Thessalonians. We've seen Paul throughout many different letters he's written, uh, encouraging churches, correcting churches. Here in this letter, for, uh, through the first three chapters, we see him speaking of his love for this church in Thessalonica, uh, his joy in getting to be a part of their growth. And then he sends Timothy back, though, to check on them. He talks about that in chapter 3. Uh, they were just eager to know what was happening. They were concerned, maybe. We'll get into that later. But Timothy, please go check on the church in Thessalonica. So this is what's happened here. Um, to understand why this is happening or to understand what's going on here, I want to build a little context for the passage for us as we're kind of jumping into the middle of the book. Um, the city of Thessalonica was the capital of the Roman province, uh, province of Macedonia, and it was first visited by Paul and Silas and Timothy on Paul's second missionary journey. Um, it was a city of trade and commerce. It was on a main highway, the capital of Macedonia, and so it was a bit of a bustling place. Uh, you would have had a very mixed bag in terms of who populated that city, a lot of Jews, but a lot of uh, Greek Gentile nations as well, and with that comes different cultural worldviews, different religions, all sorts of different things like that, all of the different enticements that the world could offer. And so during his time there, Paul reached many of the Gentiles with the gospel of Jesus Christ and changed their lives drastically. And he also had many converts come out of the, the Jewish synagogue in that city. And of these, from these people, he planted the first Christian church in Thessalonica. Um, Paul's time here, though, ended up being cut short. Uh, we see that when we read chapter 3, uh, and it's also alluded to, or you can find the account in Acts 17. The temple leaders get really mad at Paul for what he's doing. They stir up a mob, and they go looking for him, and things aren't good. So he has to leave a lot sooner than he'd like to. It's believed, if we look at the historical timetable, that he was there just a couple of weeks to maybe a month. Um, and then he moves on to Berea, Achaia, before finally landing in Athens, which chapter 3 tells us is when they decided to send uh, Timothy back to check up on how things were going with the church. So we also know if we look at the historical account and if we kind of make a timetable of the writings and acts and where Paul went and what he did, that only a couple of months have passed from the time they planted the church in Thessalonica to when they're in Athens and they send Timothy back, maybe half a year at the most. Um, 
It's never stated why Paul is so eager to send Timothy back. We don't know. There's nothing really given to us in the text. Some things kind of allude to what might be happening. Um, He's very eager to know. It's not like there's been a bad report, but there's certain things maybe. And and the church appeared healthy when they left, but there was enough happening in the city to raise concern. And we have to remember that this isn't Paul's first rodeo. This is his second missionary journey, right? So he's seen a lot when it comes to church planting, mission work, and evangelism. Um, He's seen the church in Galatia go from a healthy, uh, growing church to a church that is just just being destroyed from within by false teaching and a false understanding of salvation. Works-oriented faith versus uh, faith in in Jesus Christ. Uh, He's seen the church in Corinth where it's actually believed he wrote this letter from after Athens and they sent Timothy back. He moved on to Corinth and then wrote the letter. The church in Corinth was seen to be a very unhealthy place as well. A lot of selfishness, um, a misuse of the Lord's Supper, gluttonous behaviors there, a lack of love for each other, uncaring kind of uh, an atmosphere. And so Paul desired to make sure that these brothers and sisters of the faith were remaining true to the faith. Um, steadfast in it, leading lives that were honoring to God. And so before I go any further, I want to read verses 1 to 12 with us of chapter 4. And then we're going to kind of see what's there for us. 4, 1 to 12 reads, Finally, brothers, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is by God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God. And that in this matter, no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all such sins as we have already told you and warned you. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, he who rejects this instruction does not reject man, but God, who gives you his Holy Spirit. Now about brotherly love, we do not need to write to you. Yourselves have been taught by God to love each other, and in fact, you do love all the brothers throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers, to do so more and more. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your hands just as we have told you so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. So what we see happening in the first three chapters of this book, just to continue to lay it out for us, is Paul's love for the people. Um, His reminder of the message that he brought to them, uh, the things that they taught them while there, and his desire to see see them again. And finally, his joy in hearing that they're doing well. Um, Timothy's report comes back showing that they are honoring God with their worship, that they are holding fast to sound teaching. Things look good. Now, I want you all to dig into your memory banks of that go check on memory that you pulled up. I'm sure you all pulled up at least one, right? Um, I'm sure a lot of the scenarios, the, the message that was brought back, if you were the person being sent or maybe the things that were being told about you, weren't always great. Um, you know, go check on your little brother. I haven't seen him in a while. Ah, he's playing with matches in the basement. Um, where'd your big brother go? We were supposed to do a project together. Well, he's in the garage using power tools already, which he's not supposed to do until uh, an adult was there. This is, uh, and then where's Matthew? Oh, he's still in the bathroom. I mean, these might not be from my personal experience. Um, you can fill in the blanks there. This is hypothetical. We'll we'll say that it's hypothetical anyway. um, All of these kind of reports come back. And and when that report comes back, there was always an answer to send back from the parents. Please tell your little brother to put the matches away. It's a bad idea. Please tell Josh to be patient. I'm coming. Please tell Matthew to hurry up. We can't wait for him all day. Again, I'm not saying this was my family. Um, Maybe it was. There was always that correction, encouragement, fixing the situation statement to go back with. But sometimes the report came back good. And did you ever have an experience where the report came back good and yet there was still something to send back? 
Like you felt like just a little errand boy or girl kind of running back and forth with things from mom and dad, or maybe as mom and dad, you feel like, well, they have legs, they can do it for me, right? Um, it happens, right? So the report might come back good. Um, go check on your brother. Yeah, he's cleaning his room like you told him to. Okay, just make sure you tell him not to just throw it all in his closet. Is your brother fixing the lawnmower like I asked him to? Yeah, he is. Okay, just tell him to be careful when working with the blade, any of those things like that. Okay. Where's your brother? Well, he's out of the bathroom now. Okay, tell him to hurry up. We're still waiting. I've come a long way, folks. I promise. Um, this response, even on a good report, I want to make clear, was not, is not due to a lack of satisfaction um, or a lack of love for the individual it was being sent to. Rather, it is a loving encouragement that comes from a, a place of wanting to see people grow, to be safe, and to, to be what they were meant to be. And this is exactly what Paul is doing here with this report. Often in his letters, it's a letter of correction. Here, it's a letter of encouragement and affirmation that we're seeing. And that's what I want to share with you this morning. Um, Paul is doing exactly that. Look at verse 1. Finally, brothers, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, you, as in fact you are living. Now we want to ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. If this sermon were to have a title, or if there's a statement that I want you to kind of go home remembering, it's that. More and more. Even in the midst of receiving a good report, Paul has concern for the people. Whether they could stand against the attacks of the world, the kind of awful moral situation that uh, the church was kind of being established in, hardships maybe are going to come. And we know, according to God's word, that hardships are promised for his people. And Paul wants to encourage them, not because of any inherent or basic weakness he sees in them. Maybe it's because they're a newer church, but it's not seen and understood in the writing as him being concerned about a weakness, but primarily due to the simple fact that he just loves them. There is a simple and sincere care and compassion for these people that leads to Paul wanting to encourage them to do more and more. He wants them to be encouraged to live a holy life. Live in order to please God. So holy living is something that's often talked about in the New Testament. In this passage here, you saw the word sanctification, right? Uh, sanctification, if you don't know what it means, just a little uh, side note on that. Sanctification is just simply growing in holiness. Sanctification means to grow in righteousness and holiness being better than you were the day before, right? The New Testament talks about it all the time. Why? Why is this a common theme in literally every, every book from Matthew to Revelation? Um, well, the New Testament was written in a time when the moral climate of the world was not great. Uh, we're talking about the Roman Empire here. Um, the Roman Empire was, if you know anything about history, not... Uh, an overly fantastic place to be. Uh, it was a culture founded on self-indulgence, on dominance, on free time to chase the next best thing, slothfulness and laziness, gluttony were very commonplace. Um, sexual indulgence uh, was common and uh, just very much a debaucherous kind of nation that had found itself as the, the leading power in the known world. And so new believers living in this atmosphere um, wouldn't have had a very easy time, you know, navigating these things. Um, there would have been temptations galore uh, surrounding them all the time. And, and I want to tell you this morning that as much as we look at history in these nations that were so godless, um, our world we live in today is no different. I don't think this is news to any of you to tell you this. We live in a very godless world. Um, specifically in Canada, a nation founded on biblical principles uh, is now considered, through different polls and, and studies that have been done, to be uh, one of the, I think it ranked in the top five of the most secular nations in the world. 
We live in a godless world. We're constantly surrounded by a culture that bombards us with stimuli that our minds can't properly filter because it just comes so quick and so, so with such great volume. Uh, whether it's on our phone or our TV screens, even our conversations with other people in our day-to-day -day lives, there's this brokenness, this sinfulness that is consuming uh, everything around us. We're constantly having the enemy throw perverse weapons and distractions at us. And so what often happens when we look at a text like this one is that it's used to combat that. Um, it's used as a measuring stick and sometimes a beating stick to say, don't do that, do this. Uh, which isn't inherently wrong. I'm going somewhere with this. It's good to know the standard that has been set for us, but it becomes a problem when it becomes all about that. If we were to take a passage like 1 Thessalonians 4 and make it purely about sexual purity, about working hard, we would be missing the point of the passage. So I'm going to share with you a, a bit of an inside look to my sermon preparation process this morning. Um, as I develop a passage or work on a passage, a message for a Sunday morning or for a Friday night youth group or for Bible study, um, I read the text, I pray over it a lot, and what I'm doing as I read it a lot is, is I'm looking for something that is convicting me. I'm a firm believer that you can only teach that which you've been taught. Does that make sense? Otherwise, they're just empty words without understanding. And so for me, there has to be that level of convicting that's taken place in my own heart before I bring something forward to other people. <clears throat> and so I'm looking for that. And once God has spoken to me, once he's convicted me, I often tell people, uh, careful not to elevate your pastors to more than they are. They are just men. Men who, like us all, are trying to navigate the sinful world, try to be shaped by the word, who might sound like we have it all figured out from up here, but all week long as we've been developing this, we feel this big as we are being convicted by it ourselves. I just get to be convicted pr prior to Sunday morning. So, just so you know. Um, I'm a firm believer that that needs to take place. And once that has taken place, once God has led me to the main idea uh, of what has been spoken to my heart and what I am going to share with you, I often look around at, at what others have said about it as well. Uh, I don't want to just give you secondhand knowledge from other people, um, but it's good to kind of see what's out there and what people in the world and in the church are consuming when they're looking at these kind of passages. And so I've been blessed to have uh, some very good resources kind of um, come to me and being brought to me by other people and through uh, study and challenging and testing by the word. But sometimes I kind of, like I said, foray out into the internet and see what other people are finding. And, and I was astounded at the number of five steps to sexual purity kind of messages, you know. God hates fornication. Those kind of messages dominate this passage if we look out into the broader space of of. Bible teaching that can be found on the internet. There's some good stuff out there, but there's some awful stuff out there. I'm just going to warn you of that right now. So I want to make the point this morning that, that purity is good. That is not something I'm trying to downplay at all. It is, in fact, what God desires of you and wants of you. Uh, it was something that was a necessary discussion point for the church in Thessalonica due to the nature of, of their social context, their city, uh, their understanding of things around them, there would have been right different cultural norms in the Roman Empire. If they were kind of a hub city, so there's different religious practices and things like that, there would have been pagan people who were saved who came out of places where that was a part of their religious worship, um, sexual immorality. And so Paul needed to, to cut to this point and make a point of, of addressing it, but it's a sub-point to the main idea of what's happening here. The main point is seen in verse one. Finally, brothers, we instructed you how to live in order to please God. Pleasing God is the main point. 
Now, Paul lays out three ways uh, to please God here in this passage. Uh, Warren Wearsby, uh, Pastor Warren Wearsby, in his commentary on this book, lays it out very well. I'm going to borrow his words because he's more articulate than I am. Uh, he lays out these three points as this. To please God is seen in walking in holiness. And this is where purity lands, kind of as a sub-point under that. Walking in holiness, walking in harmony, and walking in honesty. So, with those things in mind, I want us to look at this now and, and think of the Bible as a whole book. Okay? Remove for a moment the barriers and restrictions of, of different authors, different chapters, different time periods, locations, dates, all of these things. And I want to ask you, what do you find? In this book, you find a singular narrative that runs from beginning to end, an overarching theme that tracks throughout the whole book and one key figure in the center of it all. Can you guess who that is? Sunday school answer. Everyone should be able to get it right. Jesus. It's about the gospel. It's about Jesus Christ. It's about God's redemptive plan for his creation that was set in motion the second that sin entered the world. I promise you, when you read the Bible, all of it is beneficial for us. And as you go into the Old Testament, you don't have to force it or try to cram it in there to see Jesus in the text. You don't have to say, oh, that's a picture of Jesus or that's a foreshadowing. Alistair Begg says it best when he says, we find Christ in all the scriptures. In the Old Testament, he's predicted. In the Gospels, he's revealed. In Acts, he is preached. In the Epistles, he is explained. And in Revelation, he's expected. From the beginning of the book, we see our need for him. The broken, fallen nature of man. The law that was given and man's inability to keep it fully. To do it right. We can't save ourselves. And so, Jesus came. Paid the price. And promised that he would come back. I say all this to tell you, uh, or I make a point of this to, to say this. What we're reading in 1 Thessalonians 4 is not meant to simply and purely be an attack on sexual sin. That's part of it. That's definitely part of it. It's being addressed for sure, but what is it that Paul taught when he traveled on these missionary journeys? Again, Verse 1 says, as we instructed you. Verse 8 speaks of the instruction the people receive. Verse 9, the things you've been taught by God. Paul came as a messenger of God with his teaching. And he always came preaching Christ. Preaching the gospel. The need to repent of our sins and the amazing grace and forgiveness found in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Pursue holiness, yes. Desire to live a life pleasing to God, yes. More and more do these things. But will they save you? More and more look to the cross of Jesus Christ. And in that, you will see these things kind of work themselves out of it. Charles Spurgeon once wrote, I'm a big fan of Charles Spurgeon. If you get to know me, you'll discover that. He once wrote saying, never for a moment think that our standing with God is in our sanctification. Remember, we mean that. that we, remember, that means growing in holiness, your personal holiness, right? Or our mortification, mortification, sorry, stumbling on my words. Uh, that means putting to death your old self. Okay, so I'm going to start again so that I'm not stumbling through it. We know what those two words mean. Never for a moment think that our standing with God is in our sanctification or our mortification our graces or our feelings, but know that because Christ offered a full atonement, atonement, therefore we are saved. For we are complete in him, having nothing of your own to trust to, but resting upon the merits of Jesus. So the three things Paul lays out for us for living a holy life, right? Um, do you remember them? Walk in holiness, Walk in harmony, walk in honesty. 
more and more do these things. But these things are a result of more and more looking to the cross. It's about the gospel. It's not about making a list of things you have to do. Believer, I promise you, if you've been in this for a while, you know that that will wreck you. You're going to create a standard that you will never be able to keep. You're going to create an understanding of, I got to get right before I can do this thing. And you lessen the work of the cross by making it about your effort. If you're a new believer or you've only been at it for a little while or if you're searching this morning here, that can be intimidating. That can be overwhelming. It looks unattainable and it is. You can't look at those things in that standard and that to-do list and keep it perfectly. And that chases people away from the grace that has been offered us at the cross. Jesus laid it out very well in Matthew 19, right? Easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. And the disciples, the men who walked with him, who saw him perform miraculous things said, and how can anybody be saved? Jesus says, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. The point of this passage, it's, it's like seeing one side of a, of a phone call, right? You hear somebody saying things and you kind of like get really confused sometimes because it's all over the place. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing one side of a conversation that Paul has had with these people. A message of truth, a message of hope and salvation found in Jesus Christ. Now go and do these things more because of the change that has happened in you. And sometimes we as believers get that mixed up and we make it a, a moralistic pursuit. And we deify that more than we do Jesus. In the last year and a half, this has become more clear than ever. I say these things because I love you. We as a church have not done what we were made to do in the last year and a half. Globally. What were we made to do? We were made for this. We were made for adversity. We were made for dark times. We were made to be salt and light in the midst of that darkness. And when that darkness came and found us here in North America and our comfort was broken, we failed to answer the call. We made it about the things instead of about the cross. More and more desire to worship with your brothers and sisters, yes. More and more recognize there are things happening out there that are wrong, that need to be, you know, not, we can't ignore them. More and more encourage each other, but more and more and more, all of these things come out of a focus on that. You can't serve Christ if you are pursuing and pushing your own gains, your own agenda. The more we look to him, the more we see the standard that we were given. Avoid sexual immorality, yes. What is the reasoning when we dig further into it in the passage? Yes, it's wrong. Yes, it's a, it's a sin within your own body that God has, has purified and has cleansed. But it's also wrong to take advantage of your brother in this way, to do things that would damage and hurt other people. Those who look to damage and hurt other people, it says the Lord will punish them for all such sins as we've already told you and warned you. Um, God will punish. He didn't call you to be impure. He called you to live holy. Therefore, he who, restrict, who rejects these instructions does not reject man, but God. What else does it give us here? Walk holy. There's that. How do we walk? Um, oh, man. I walk in harmony. I almost lost myself there. Uh, walk holy. How do we walk in harmony? Well, the next verse is now about brotherly love. This church specifically, you're doing good. Okay, we, we don't need to teach you about that. It's good. More and more. More and more. What is the standard for love that we have been given? The standard for love we have been given is in Jesus Christ. Who when the world hated him, when the people who a few days prior praised him and welcomed him with cheers, spat on him and cursed his name, he loved them. So whether you feel like 
you or we or us as, as a whole are struggling in that or you think we're doing well, more and more. It's been so easy in the last year and a half to look at other people who think differently than we do and to automatically hold it against them, to think differently. And whether or not you think it's outright hate, you don't have to have said the words, oh, I hate that person for how they think, is there something burning inside of your heart that has not removed itself about differing opinions? We're called to be united in the gospel, united in Jesus' name, not united because other people think and feel the same way I do. Remember what Spurgeon said? It's not about your feelings. It's not about those things. It's about the cross. It's about Jesus Christ. And then lastly, walk honestly. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Mind your own business. Work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. And there's a desire here to see the church be in the world, not of the world. Work. Do those things that you have before you. Don't pursue the lazy, slothful lifestyle of the Roman culture. Serve, because the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Again, he is our example. So we can look to these things we're called and asked to do, but we don't understand how to do them unless more and more we look to the cross. I want to encourage you all with that this morning. I want to leave you with that. I want those words to stick to you the way they've stuck to me. Um, I wasn't sure what I was going to preach on here, and it wasn't until... Uh, two weeks ago, I was just reading the Bible with my wife in the morning and we came across this passage and those words more and more have been bouncing around my brain ever since. Are we content with where God has brought us, with what we have here and now, or do we want more and more to proclaim his name, to please him? What is God's desire? Not that any should perish, but that all should be saved. The cross is the crux of it all. The cross is the more and more. The cross is the heart of the church and what we're made to be. And so I encourage you, brothers and sisters, don't look at the world's troubles and let them overwhelm you. Look to the cross. Look to our hope. Look to our call that we've been given. And encourage each other in that. Walk faithfully in it. And let's pray and hope for and, and, and look to see a revival of faith that comes out of all of this that we've been in for the last two, a year and a half. Revival, because more and more the cross of Christ changes hearts and leads us in what is good. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much uh, for, again today, this group and the opportunity to be here. I just pray that more and more, Lord, we would um, rid ourselves of our own selfish desire to be seen, to be known, uh, to be heard, to have our desires met, Lord, and that we would look to your desires, that we would look to the cross, that we would look to the purpose uh, in your coming to take that. And then that would shape how we live that these things that we do, the things that we're called to, that we read in here, would be a response to that. Not a mandate in order to be saved, but a joyful response from people who have been saved and out of a desire for others to see and experience it as well. God, I pray that we would see clearly what you long for us to be. That we would see clearly the need that exists in this world, that we would see clearly, Lord, your love for us poured out in amazing ways at Calvary. God bless us as we go into this week. Encourage us by your word. Let this be a time and a space of fueling up that we might go and actively be that which you have called us to be. God, just bless us as we do so. Thank you for this time and this space. Thank you for the worship that has occurred this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Matt. I really appreciated what you said to us. The hymn that we're going to sing at the end is 
I think a recap of what you just finished saying. Uh, that we as a church are to be a church of kindred minds focused on, on God. That we are to have fellowship. That we are to share each other's burdens, bear each other's burdens, pray and... Uh, and interesting thing is when we have kindred spirits, when we're not together, we miss each other. So shall we stand as we sing, Blessed be the tie that binds. Hebrews 13, 20 to 21 says, Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. This one is for you from Jesus. Jesus loves you, my friend. Jesus loves you. He loves you so much. I received these gloves that I really love. It's my favorite color. <laughs> yes. And I received this awesome mask that I'm going to scare my little sister and brother in the night with. <laughs> yes. And this pants. And I'm going to use them in every book I have for school. And these awesome <laughs> socks. And yeah, I just love it. It's like, <laughs> it brings this feeling to my heart that there's somebody out there that wants to share God's word. And even though we feel lost, that God is not there, that yes, God exists and he hears our prayers. <laughs> Thank you.